are starting this new series, and I, 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 as a preface to the series, so you know where we're headed, because um, you're saying, like, eight weeks? That's a long one. Well, it's okay, because um, Jesus had a lot to say, and that's, well, that's what it is. When you talk about red-letter living, um, most of you, if you have a Bible, and hopefully you bring your Bible to church, um, that's, that's the best thing you can do. Um, but in your Bible, if you've never noticed this, maybe, you've, maybe you're watching or something and you don't know this, um, the red letter edition of a Bible means that the words of Jesus actually are in red. Um, so if you ever look like, why are some of these words red and others are just black? Um, now, uh, it's funny, I'm doing this series, but the Bible I actually, um, my older Bible uh, sort of fell apart. And so I had to switch Bibles and the Bible I had does not have a red letter. And so I'm actually doing a red letter living without red letters, and that's a little odd, but um, the whole idea behind the series uh, it comes down to one, one or two words, and I want to I talk about them as we get into it this morning, and I want to start off with belief. Um, I, I was sitting back the other day, and I was thinking about this. I, I, I came up with this thought about belief, and it, it's so important that I, I really want you to know this, but when I think about belief, here's the idea, and everybody, it's one of these statements that you're going to have to Like, you might have to read it twice to get what I'm saying, and hopefully you get it. But here it is. People, people, that's you and me, can believe they believe something that they may not actually believe. Okay, stop and think about it. This is so important, this this one statement, to everything we're going to talk about for the next eight weeks. People can believe they believe something that they may not actually believe. And here's what I mean. Let me give you some examples here. We all, I think we could all be clear on this, that we all, pretty much, unless you're, you're a little bit out of it, we all would say that I believe that I should eat healthy and exercise daily. That's what I, I'd say I believe. Um, here's another one. We probably all would agree that it is important that we should not spend our money foolishly and frivolously, but we should save it more than we spend it. We say we believe these things, but if we were to investigate, well, let me just tell you, I've got a smoked meatloaf for lunch that's got pepper jack cheese in the middle of it and wrapped in bacon. That's lunch. Can I get a witness to that one? Hey, I'm just saying. um, And it was, we cook ahead of time because we don't have time on Sundays to cook um, between services and all that. And so I was, I smoked it yesterday for about two and a half hours. Uh, Is it healthy for me? Absolutely not. But there's going to be a lot of bacon, a lot of meat, and I'm just try- pretty excited about it. I'm just saying that, okay? I'm just saying that. I'll let you know how it was. <laughs> I'm sure you would. But the deal is, isn't it true? And this is the sad thing. People believe that they believe something that they may not actually believe. And that's scary. In fact, I, I came up with this when you start thinking about this statement. And that, this statement, I, there again, really s- let this soak into you. People believe they believe something that they may not actually believe. Um, came across an article years ago by a psychiatrist who was uh, dealing with some issues. And he wrote this article about it. And I thought it, was, it helped me with some of the thinking I was going through. He said this, that he was treating some patients that had beliefs, strong beliefs. In fact, one of his patients had a strong belief that he could fly. And I'm not talking about like he sang the song, I believe I could fly. He was like, I'm going to get out on the ledge and jump, right? He thought Superman had nothing on him. He's going to jump out and go, go flying. Now, they, they had to restrain him and make sure, like, you don't get above the furniture level. You can't do that. Um, but that's one of them. There was another lady in this, and this is crazy. This is an American psychiatrist, by the way. This lady that he was treating, her beliefs, her beliefs were that she was swapped at birth with another baby. And actually, the other baby was a baby from the royal family over in England. And she had this belief so much that the psychiatrist in this article he wrote said that she had even would had adopted a British accent, even though she's not British at all. Never been there, you know, she's lived 100% of her life here in America. But here's what I really noticed. (laughs) Here's what I really noticed. In this article, as the psychiatrist was writing about these things and and describing what he was talking about, his condition, he didn't call these things beliefs. When he talked about his patients and what they had, he used another word instead of beliefs. Delusions. See, here's the deal, and this is, this is so important that I, I want you to understand this. Beliefs that have no co- uh, connection to reality, even if they're sincere, aren't beliefs at all. They're delusions. 
And yet, I, I think we all struggle and we all have to admit that the reality of our lives sometimes don't align up as Christ followers. And if you're not a Christ follower, if you're here for the hook, you can just sit back and relax and, re, uh, and, and listen in. But as Christ followers, the truth of the matter is we sometimes don't let our life's beliefs line up with what we say we believe. And so this statement, people believe they can believe something that they may not believe, might a lot of times be true of Christianity. Might a lot of times be true of us. And yet, as I, I was investigating to do this, <laughs> the overwhelming thought, and of course, if you go through the Gospel of John, John uses the word believe a lot, because that was what his aim was. But here's what I found. You know, Jesus didn't use the word believe a whole lot. When he called people to, to do something with him, he used another word. He used a word called follow. See, Jesus really never called anybody just to believe in him. You know why? You can go through the New Testament, you can find this to be true, that one of the New Testament writers tells us that even the devil, even the demons believe in Jesus. There is such as demonic faith, it's not saving faith at all, but it, they, they believe that. And I think we have misled Christians today in Christianity to say, hey, just believe and sit still in your pew. Just believe and come to one service a week. Just believe and just pay your tithe. And that's it. And that's a lie. Because we believe something that we, we, we believe that we believe something that may not actually be true that we believe it. And that's the truth. You see, here's the deal. Following Jesus is what happens when our lives, the key word, align with what we say we believe about him. See, I don't understand churches today that say, I'm a Christ follower, I believe in him, but you don't show up to services regularly. I'm talking all of them. You don't go to Bible studies. You don't go to ladies' groups. You don't go to men's groups. You don't go to your neighbors and tell them about Jesus. Oh, yeah, this is going to be a tough series, isn't it? Yeah, it's true. In fact, Jesus felt this way about it because he called people to follow him. And in Luke chapter 19, and, and by the way, our series, we're going to be in the book of Matthew throughout the whole thing. Today, we're going to get to Matthew. But to start our story, uh, there's a story Jesus tells in Luke chapter 19 that is so important. So if you have Bibles, we're in Luke chapter 19. The setting for Luke chapter 19 is something you're probably familiar with because I just preached on it not too long ago. Luke chapter 19 begins in Jericho with the parade that was celebrating Jesus as he came to town, a little wee little man who named Zacchaeus who got up in a tree. Remember, we preached on this a couple weeks ago. And so as we finish out, we're going to talk about as he leaves Jericho and heads to Jerusalem, what happened there. But the last statement he makes in dealing with Zacchaeus is an important one, and he starts off, and we're talking about today, if I were going to title today's message, it would be Living Life on Mission. Jesus says this after he's dealt with, with Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus is, has come back to uh, what God wanted for him. He says this, For the Son of Man, that is the title of Jesus, for the Son of Man came to seek and save and to save the lost. Jesus was well aware of the mission. And then this happens, verse 11, while they were listening. Now, who was listening? Oh, that was the Jesus parade. Remember, these are the guys that got up at 5 a.m. and they got the Jesus, I love Jesus shirts. What about you? They got the signs. They saved their place in line. These are the ones that wanted Zacchaeus to get a piece of Jesus in mind. They are all listening, plus his disciples. He wanted them to tell them a parable. And that's what we're going to talk about. Verse number 12, and I am going to try and cut through some of this quickly. This is a long story. Jesus begins to tell this parable. He said, uh, a man of noble birth, a man of noble birth. Now, remember, anytime I told you about parables, there's always two things you've got to find out. Who the God or Jesus figure is in the parable and who we are in the parable, you and I. So he said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So let me just help you because I don't want you getting lost in this whole thing. The man of noble birth is Jesus, Okay. That's who this is. By the way, there's another similar parable to this, um, not to be confused with this. This is not the same as the parable of the talent. So anybody who's got that, there's two different outcomes on these things, and I'll point it out as we go through. He says, a man of noble birth, man of noble birth, went to a distant country. That would be here to earth. Jesus left his throne as God came to a distant country to have himself appointed to be king. That's what Christmas is all about. He was born in a major, born to be the king of kings and lord of lords, and then to return to his throne in glory. That's what he came for, and so that's the explanation. Verse 13, he says, so he called ten of his servants. Now, um, 
when you get into numbers of the Bible, a lot of them have meanings. In this particular case, 10 doesn't have a deep significance. It was just a number of completion. It's a number just like seven is. 10 is also uh, considered a somewhat perfect number. Um, we would, it's just a round number. So he's just saying there's a group of 10, give or take, you know, we're not going to count them, called 10 servants, and notice they're servants, that's their job, and gave them 10 minas. Now, you're like, what's a minas? It's money, okay? It's a weird name to say, so I have a hard time just keep saying it, so I might just refer to it as money. But if you want to know how much it is, it's about four months worth of salary, okay? So this isn't like, hey, he gave him 10 bucks. He gave him each one got one minus. There's 10 guys with 10 minus, so each one gets one, and that's about four months' wages if you work six days a week. That's how it figures out, and it's a Greek term for money. Okay, Maybe your Bible uses a different term. Um, this would be the more correct term to use at this point. And notice what he said, and I highlighted some of these words as we put them on screen because I wanted to see them. He said, put this money to work, he said, until I come back. That is the command given. And it's similar to a command that we're going to talk about a little later. But he said, put this money, use it, use it, put it to work. And I like the way he says it because he says, put this money to work as if the money had ability to do things without you. He didn't say, go out and do some work with this money. He said, put the money to work until I come back. And then he goes on and he says, skip down a verse, um, verse 15 this man, who we said was Jesus, he was made king. Okay, now I skipped a verse in there because it's not as relevant to what we're talking about. You can go back and read that and you can understand a little bit more. It's got deeper meaning. But he was made king. So Jesus, evidently, we know what's going to happen. He was made king because he died on the cross and his ascension to heaven made him king of kings because he went up there to sit on his throne. And that's where he is. Okay, if you didn't know that, I, I hate to, to give you a spoiler, but that was a spoiler. He was made king, however... And returned home, then he went and set, sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order, and this is why, to find out what they had gained with it. They were supposed to come up with something that they were supposed to do. There was an expectation of a return, and so that's very important there. We keep going, verse 16, so you get the first one. The first, and let me just spoil it. He's not going to go through all ten of them. So if you're like, oh, this is going to be a long one, he's going to go through all ten of these guys. I'll explain why he doesn't go through all ten of them. The first one, that is the first servant, came out and said, Sir, notice the highlighted words, your mina has earned. Now, what did the master tell him to do? Who's paying attention? He said, put your money, put the money to work, right? Put the money to work. He didn't say, you have to go to work. He said, put the money to work. The money's going to do the work. And so what is this guy? He answers politely. The first one's being inquired, what'd you do with it? He says, sir, your mina has earned 10 more. Now, <laughs> I, maybe you're not into math like I was. Okay, I was a math teacher for years. I love math. So if we figure out percentages, if you brought one and got another one back, that would be a 100% return. He didn't get one back. He got 10 back. So we go 10 times 100 is... A thousand, there we go. Add one zero and you're good. So this guy gets an amazing return. I mean, how many would like their retirement account to be a thousand? You know, I'd like mine to go a thousand, right? This guy is a rock star among servants, isn't he? This guy should be celebrated. I mean, who ever gets a thousand percent return on their investment? Well, this guy did. And he, he, he did a great job. And so he's pretty excited about it. And so what happens? The next verse tells us, this is the answer to the master is, well done, my good servant. Great words to hear. Well done, my good servant. His master replied, because you have been trustworthy, or you could say faithful, that's another translation of that word in the, in the original language, because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter, four months' wages is pretty small to God, take charge of ten cities. So I feel like we should have, I should have had Donnie come up here and help me out with this because he can do the voices and all this. But I feel like this is where, if you're running a game show, the game show host looks over and says, Bob, tell them what they've won. <laughs> so this is how we're going to play it out. So tell them what he's got for earning that 10 minus on the money. Well, it's a year off of work. Is that what it said? Nope. You get a vacation in the Maldives. Nope. 
Nope. What does God, uh, what does the master give? The master, the king now, he says, you know what? Because you've been faithful, here's your big reward. You get more work. Woo! Why isn't everybody celebrating? It's important you know that. More work is the reward for good work. Verse, the next verse, we go on. He, he, he says in verse 18, the second one. Now, I, you're already panicking like, you told us we were going through all 10 of these. The second one, just in case you thought guy number one was just unusually good and he just made it all happen by ease and nobody else did anything like this, the second one came and said, sir, almost the exact same words, your Mina has earned five more. Hey, not quite as good as the other guy, but I'd take 500% return on my investments, wouldn't you? I mean, you're lucky if you get an 8% return these days. 500%. He's doing awesome, man. Can he come manage my, 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 my finances for me? Because these guys are doing good. And so he uses the same term once again, and his master answers same way. You take charge of five cities. You take charge of five cities. Now, I told you we're not going through all ten of these. We're only going to go through three servants. Because really, what, what we have in these ten are two different attitudes, and that's the, the, the whole idea here. So we go on to then another. And that word another, this doesn't mean the next guy up. That is, a, in, the, in the original language, that would be the term for a different one. Different in what way? Different in attitude. Different in approach. Different in every aspect. Um, the Apostle Paul uses this language where he talks about someone bringing a different gospel, another gospel, in one of his writings. That's the same word here. The another servant came and said, Sir, that's a good start, here is your mina. Or the original language would have better translated it probably as, Behold! That, 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 I mean, that kind of like, Behold! Everybody say that with me once. Behold! Okay, it doesn't, come on, get into this. <laughs> one, one more time, we're going to try this, ready? Behold! Okay, what's he trying to do here? He's trying to impress and trying to sell him on something that you know is not, you already know it's not going to be good, is it? Right? Behold! Here it is! Here it is! Once in a lifetime! Here it is! I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. <laughs> really? <laughs> that's, that, that's what I'm sitting there. If I'm one of the guys on the sideline, I'm like, Really? Good job, buddy. It took a lot of effort. And that's sort of how the master answers. But he doesn't say just that. He, he's going to dig himself into a deeper hole. He says, I was afraid of you. Okay. We're taught the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and that, that's a good thing, but it's not that kind of fear. It's a stupid kind of fear. It's a fear we shouldn't have. He says, I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. Who talks like this to their master, the guy that could put them out of this life? You're a hard man. And then he says something even more insulting. He says, think about this sentence. I think we've, you've probably read this before and you just sort of passed by it. He says, you take out what you didn't put in. And you reap what you did not sow. Okay? So if we've passed, I know since COVID we haven't passed offering plates, and that's probably a thing of the past now. But think about this. What did he say? You took out what you didn't put in. So, okay, so we're passing the offering plate and we get to J.A., and he takes out what he didn't put in. Anybody got a problem with that one? What, what, what I've just said about J.A.? He's a thief, dishonest, low in character. He just said that about the master, who we already said was Jesus Christ, right? And not only that, you reap what you didn't sow. Okay, I don't know, maybe you had some neighbors that were friendly, but think about this. There was that one guy that had the property fence marked off and don't come across it and he was growing either corn or tomatoes or blackberries or blueberries or strawberries or peaches or something that you want an apple and you went across because no one was looking that's what he's saying about the master he's saying you reaped you took what you didn't earn Ooh, that's his whole plan to impress the master that was what began with a behold mm, not too wise this guy doesn't have it going on we go on, his master, now this is where we're going to find out, how does the master respond? His master, Jesus Christ, replied, by the way, if the master's Jesus Christ, who's the servants? Yeah, we are. 
Okay, I just want, we should have said that earlier. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words. By your own words. Now, he's not going to say, I agree with your words. He's saying, these are your words. I'm going to judge you by them. You good and faithful, my good, my good servant, like he called the other ones? No, not at all. He says, you wicked servant. You wicked servant. And then he goes on to say, you knew. This is what you said you knew. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man, taking what I did not put in. You think of me as a guy who takes things in risk and reaping what I didn't sow, being dishonest, low character. Why then? Why then? And that's the question. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit? So that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest. That's the bare minimum. Why didn't you do the least amount of work? Why didn't you do the least? Remember, the money's going to work for you. That's what I told you to do. Put my money to work. Why didn't you do the least? Wouldn't that have been the easiest thing? And this is a question we have to understand, because let me just give you this. If you don't know what the money represents, the money represents the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. And the question of this is that question of this story is that question we need to answer. Why didn't you put it to use? Why didn't you simply make the most easy? Why? Why? We go on. Verse number 26, skip down a couple of verses. This is what the master ends up telling after it's all sorted out and they've taken away from this wicked servant and he's, he's punished him a little bit. He says this, he replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Now, we already talked about it. That's, that's, a, that's a threat from Jesus to Christians, servants, about spreading the gospel. That's, that's how it goes. And when we think about the story, what we have to realize, first of all, I want to point out just a couple of little things that you might have not gotten before we get to our actual text. This whole idea of, of not forgetting the mission that God has called us to, that's the point of this. Uh, it's not the same as the story of the, if you're, you're like, hey, I thought that was just like the parable of the talents. The parable of the talents, the difference is, in the parable of the talents, everyone got different amounts. The talents represent different gifting that God gives us. This one, they all got the same. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that they're giving here. They have the opportunity as servants to work for the master, right? Let, let the gospel work for them. And that's all it is. And I like that. Because if you didn't notice, the gospel will work even if you don't have to. You don't have to. You're not a car salesman. We're not trying to convince people something that's not true. You just need to present the gospel. Put it to work. That's what the master says. But we have to realize that there is a, a, the reward for good and faithful is always going to be more work. And that's what's different somewhat according to our American standard because we are working hard so we don't have to ever work again. And the truth of the matter is, for God, that's never true. If you're thinking, hey, I've got to the point where I don't have to do as much for God anymore, then you are living a lie that Satan has told you, my friend, because Jesus Christ has told a parable that says it's the exact opposite, that when you serve God and you get rewarded, you're going to do more. You're going to get more responsibility, more work to do. And that's what we should be aiming for because everything is built in our lives for us to glorify God. That's the first easy lesson to see. But he goes on a little bit more, and this is really the point I really want you to get, is this. The servant, <laughs> the servant who was the wicked servant, the servant wasn't at all concerned about the king's return. And this is so important you get this. That servant wasn't at all concerned about the king's return. Why? Because he didn't bother with the king's business. The servant didn't think the king was coming back, so he didn't bother doing the king's business. That's why he became a wicked servant. And I'm afraid there's a lot of us that we're going to be standing there empty-handed one day when Jesus returns, or maybe we're not even going to be where we're supposed to be. We're going to be out doing our own thing for our own pleasure, and he's going to say, why didn't you do the bare minimum? And we're going to be like, oh, I, th I thought you were a hard man. I thought you reaped where you didn't sow. I thought you got things because you're just who you are. We're going to give excuses that don't matter. 
the truth of the matter is, the expectation of the master is for us to labor for him, not for ourselves. See, we build kingdoms, but most of our kingdoms are our kingdoms, not God's kingdom. That's the truth. And that's what this whole parable is really about. Faithfulness yields great reward, but unfaithfulness, if you, if you check out the rest of the story, unfaithfulness yields an empty life. See, everything that was given to him was taken away from him because he didn't do what the master had asked him to do because he wasn't expecting the king to ever return. And I think there's a lot of Christians living as if the king is not going to return. I'd be scared to miss church thinking that God's not coming back. And if you're, you're so inclined to say, well, I don't care, I'll meet God, then you're more of a fool than I thought you were. I'm just saying that. Because the Bible's clear that it's a scary thing to fall in the hands of a, an angry God. It really is. And that anger God has is based on the passage that deals with idolatry, a worship of anything other than God. Our text today is Matthew, familiar text, Matthew chapter 28. The setting is after Jesus is arisen, he's instructing, and Matthew records the final events that, that he's going to record about the life of Jesus Christ. And this is that passage we know is the Great Commission, because the whole idea today is living life on mission. And I want to give you three elements of a life of living life on mission, because this is one of the most important things that Jesus wanted for us. So we look in the first couple of verses, in verses 16 and 17, we pick up, Jesus says this, then the 11 disciples, obviously one of them's gone because he really wasn't a God follower. He had the empty life. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Okay, So if you remember last week, Tracy preached on John chapter 21. This is actually the setting right here. This is Matthew's account. He gives it much shorter because he wasn't concerned about Peter. Then the 11 disciples went to this mountain in Galilee, and they're waiting for him. They, they do a little fishing and all that. They're just waiting for him. And it says in verse 17, when they saw him, that is Jesus, when they saw him. Now, he's appeared a couple of little short times, but now it's the first time he's going to spend any time. And what happens? These disciples, their life has changed. And it says they worshiped him, but, and there's always a but, some doubted. They worshiped him, but some doubted. Some doubt it. How can you doubt God? And we find here in the first element that we need to, to help live our life on mission is to aim at the right target. Aim at the right target. I mean, good grief. That's crazy to think about uh, shooting, a, whether it's a gun, an arrow, or a basketball, or anything you're shooting at. Why would you aim at the wrong one? I remember one time going, going uh, we, had, we had a church bowling league, and I was down with some teenagers and, man, they were pointing out this one guy had knocked down all these pins, and it was so, so amazing all that. Problem was, wasn't in the lane he was bullying. in. That's a problem. Not aiming at the right target. And I think what we find here is there are some people that still, no matter what, even with Jesus. Now, think about how spectacular this was and that verse that said, some doubted, right? Jesus had been dead, buried in a tomb. I mean, not just the swoon like some people think or fainted. Jesus was dead as a doornail. They wrapped him up. They put pounds and pounds and pounds of, of spices to keep his body from stinking because they were expecting decay. And now he's standing there conversing with them, having breakfast on the beach, going into the, the teaching mode. And so some of them worship, but some of them still doubt it. And I can't understand those doubt, doubters unless they were the wicked servants who didn't aim at the right target. And I think when we live our life on mission, what we're going to find is there are people in this life that get so consumed with this life. In the scope of it, I saw this illustration one time done at a church that I was at. A guy took a line, and he took the line, and he stretched it from the back of the auditorium all the way to the front. And he had two teenagers hold the line. And he said, this is your life represented as an eternal life. He said, it's really not a great representation because the string ends. But he said, for this, this idea, this is the whole idea. And then he took a marker, a permanent marker, held it up, and he touched the, the, touched the, the line. And a very small dot, you had to be right on top of it to see it. And he said this. He says, this dot on this line of your eternal life, he said, this dot represents your days here on earth. And when you think about it, he's so right. Yet we do everything about these days here on earth. 
we get so excited about the days here. And Jesus wants us to know, as he's telling his disciples at the very end of his days with them, aim at the right target because aiming at the right target will help you live your life as God has directed. And that's what he wants. Worship God. Don't doubt. The second thing we find in verse 18, as we continue on, it says, then Jesus came and came to them and said, and this is that famous verse that you probably learned, it's the Great Commission, the beginning of it, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Remember, he's the king of the story. He started off as not the king because he was born in a manger, went through, nobody believed him. They, in fact, they hated him. They didn't want him to be the king. That's the rest of the story that we didn't talk about. And they crucified him thinking they were going to stop him. But death couldn't stop him because he was buried and he rose again and he was headed to his kingdom as the king of kings and lord of lords to sit on his throne and then he's going to expect to hear what his servants did. And that's the part of the story we're in right now. And he says, all authority is given to me. And so the second, second um, item of living this element of living this life on the mission is aiming not with just a right target but with accuracy. <laughs> You've got to have some accuracy. Man, you're shooting at a bullseye. You don't want to hit... You don't want to, well, you don't want to hit off target, first of all, but is, there's nobody going out, hey, see this target? I shot the outside ring. I shot it. That was so cool. No, what do we want? We want the dead center. We want the bullseye. We want to hit the target. And, and hey, you know what? That means we're going to have to live our life with the right focus here, and that's the whole idea. And the right focus that we need to have, this accuracy, is to understand that your boss doesn't have all authority, your spouse doesn't have all authority, you certainly don't have all authority, your kids don't have all authority, Joe Biden doesn't have all authority, the government doesn't have all authority, there isn't a person on this planet that has all authority. All authority has been given to Jesus Christ and him alone, and he's the one we need to please. That's the whole idea here. So why do we spend so much time trying to please ourselves? Delusion, isn't it? Remember this, what we started off with? People believe that they believe in something that they really don't. Is that you? Huh. The truth is, Jesus didn't call us to be believers. He called us to be followers. And that brings us to the third aspect, which ends in the last two verses. He continues on. He says, therefore, because of this, because I have all authority, all power, because I am the central focus of your life, here's what I want you to know. Go and make disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded, commanded you and surely I will be with you always to the very end of this age. We're not just going to aim for the right target and aim with accuracy, but we need to aim with clarity. Clarity. What are we supposed to do? So we, we're supposed to live our life as a disciple. Live as a disciple on a mission. A disciple maker. And, and you know, the problem with that servant in the story that we read, the wicked servant, is he forgot that he was a servant of the king. What was he doing while the king was gone? That's the question. Obviously, he wasn't doing anything he was supposed to do. I'm sure he was probably out with his friends going, hey, look at this money I got. That, the word it said that he was wrapped up in a napkin, actually, the, the, the idea behind that was it was wrapped up in a, like a neckerchief or something like that. He didn't bury it in the ground. He probably put it in his little pocket or somewhere where he could show it off to his friends, and they went out clubbing, they went out into the movies, they went out to have a good time and said, hey, hey look what he gave me. I got four months of salary. Hey, he lived it up like he was the king because he never thought the king was going to return. So he never did the king's business. Did he believe that the king was real? Absolutely. What he didn't believe, though he probably told you it was true, he didn't believe in the truth that the king was actually coming back. As we finish out today, the bottom line is this. Red letter living, what is it? Red letter living requires red letter devotion. Hey, either you're a follower of Jesus Christ or you're not today. And you say, well, this is pretty hard today. I'm only giving you what the Bible tells. I didn't make up anything today. It was right there in, in print. I Really, the preaching is pretty easy because you just go through and, and, and give what the Bible says. I don't have to make anything up. The truth of the matter is you may believe in your belief that may not be really a belief. 
Maybe today you're, you're sitting back going, yeah, I'm a Christian. My parents brought me up in church. That's great. I think that was a good thing for them to do. But if you're not following Jesus, you probably aren't. You might be the wicked servant. If you're not doing business for the king, if you're not expecting the king's return, and by the way, he never tells you when he's coming back exactly. That's a scary story when you think about it. Because the expectation, once again, is a return on his investment through us. So, have you aligned your beliefs with a true life? The truth of the matter is, most of us in here would say we believe all the stuff that's written in this Bible. But the honest truth is, most of us aren't doing anything like the Bible says. And that's why the world isn't attracted to us. Because they know we say we believe something that we may not really believe. Let's start practicing the red letter edition. Let's start taking the words of Jesus and actually living them. Let's stop taking it and going, hey, well, you don't understand. I've got to get ready for my job. I've got to do my things. My, my world's more important than the Jesus world. It's not. Maybe you've got friends that you go out with all the time and have a good time, but you never talk about Jesus. And your excuse is, well, they wouldn't want to. <laughs> is that really what the king would be okay with? We aren't doing our job. We're not making disciples. We're not baptizing. And you say, well, it's the pastor's job. No, it's everybody's job in here. It's we, the Christ followers' job. We, the church at Maple Springs. That's what, as a servant of God, that's what we're supposed to be doing. God's not going to ask you how big was your house. How many cool trips did you take while you are out? How many fun things did you do with your life? How much money did you save and spend on yourself? How many shopping trips did you go on with the girls? How many shoes or purses do you have or guns? He's going to say, what did you do with the money that I told you to put to work? When I come back, I'm checking. Do you expect the king's return? What if it were this afternoon? 